What does it mean for you and me as believers to walk and live as children of the light? Uh, We're going to start by reading verses 7 and 8. He says, Be not ye therefore partakers with them, referring to those who are justifying sin in the church. He says, Be not partakers with them, for ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. We are, I believe, in the place that we're in in our nation, uh, politically and spiritually, uh, not so much because uh, the world is evil around us, but I really believe that we are where we are at because Christians have not been the light that we needed to be in good times. You know what, Ryan? I see my wife walking out there. If you could let her in. I believe we as Christians have not been the light that we could have and should have been. And so we're seeing darkness overtaking not just this nation but the world. You know, I have to keep reminding myself that as tough as it is right now to be speaking to you through a camera once again for the second time now this year, there are uh, missionary friends of mine in Europe who have not been able to speak to their congregation face to face since this whole thing started uh, earlier this year. And it's a tragic thing, it's a difficult thing, but folks, I believe much rises and falls on the faith of the children of God and their willingness and their obedience to be a light. And so the Apostle Paul is having to warn us to not be partakers with those who justify sin and say this is just part of the Christian experience. And folks, there's been much of that in the church here in America and even around the world in which we justify sin and say it's okay, either by what we say right from the pulpit or the way that we live. And the Apostle Paul begins by saying, Do not be partakers. So that's our number one point. Don't participate in the the sinful behavior of those who do not know God. Do not participate in the sinful behavior of those who don't know God. He says, why? Because this was part of uh, who you were before. He says, verse 8, you were sometimes, there was one time in which you were darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. So he's bringing us back to our identity. He's reminding us what our former identity was, and he's reminding us that we have a new identity, and he he calls us uh, darkness. Before we were uh, Christians, followers of Christ, we were known as children of disobedience. He uses that phrase in verse 6. He says, Let man, no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That used to be you and me. Now our identity is one of children of light and children of God, but before this we were disobedient children. We were by nature lawbreakers. We were by nature disobedient to the law of God. Jesus said it this way, John 8, 44, he says, Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. It's a tragic thing when Christians live a life still just as bound by their flesh as they were before they were saved. That's a tragic place to be in. But you know, What we've seen, especially in the last couple of decades that we're seeing in this new form of Christianity, in this kind of uh, uh, entertainment-driven Christianity, we are seeing today that uh, the divorce rate now among Christians is coming very, very close to what it was among lost people. We're having the same problems with the same addictions and alcoholism and drug addiction and the same struggles with depression as this lost world. And folks, it should not be that way. There should be a greater victory for us as Christians. Not that we become perfect all of a sudden. It's a process. But folks, there should be a distinction 
rather than using the grace of God as a license to sin, as so many have been doing. He says, before you trusted Christ, he says, you were sometimes darkness. He didn't just say you lived in the dark. He said you were dark. That's who we were. Folks, we were completely depraved. Completely unable to merit God's favor. We were completely evil. Once again, folks, that's what sets us apart as Christians and as conservatives. We believe in the depravity of man. The lost world around us believes mankind is basically good and that we're evolving into something better. And that's why you have in capitalistic systems checks and balances on man's depravity because we understand the depravity of the human heart. The socialist would say we're creating this great utopia in which mankind almost becomes God. We don't need God because we are basically good. And all we need to do is improve our environment and we become better. Folks, that is not the case. Romans 5.12 tells us this, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Folks, we sin because we're sinners. We, are, we sin because we have a sin nature. And what the Apostle Paul is reminding us of is even though we still have that sin nature within us, we also have a new nature. We were one time only dark, with no light within us. Now, in Christ, we are children of the light. And now we should be living in uh, the light of that new nature. And it's a process to learn how to, uh, little by little, come out of the darkness into the light. But it's a process and a war that must be waged. And this book ends in Ephesians chapter 6, speaking of that war that rages. And much of that war is within our own heart. So first of all, folks, do not participate in the sinful behavior of those who don't know God. Why? Because that former identity was depraved. It was evil. We now have a new identity. And let's focus on that in verse 8. He says, For ye were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the Lord. Walk as children of the light. So folks, when you trust Jesus Christ, he brings you out of darkness into light. He does that through his word. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. So uh, God has been gracious to each of us that have believed to bring the truth into our life through various messengers, whether it be through books, whether it be through friends, or whether it be through preachers. And we heard the truth. And God used that truth to awaken in us a conviction of sin. The Holy Spirit worked in our heart, and we realized we were sinners, unable to merit God's, um, God's favor. And we cast our complete dependence on Jesus Christ, on the work that he did for us. And in that moment, we went from being darkness to now being children of the light. Before, grasping for a relationship with God, now resting in our relationship with him. Colossians 1.13 says it this way, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. I love that uh, phraseology. We've been literally lifted out of one kingdom and placed into the very kingdom of God, the family of God. Lifted out of darkness. And he's delivered us from the power of darkness and now placed us into the kingdom of his dear son. Christian, are you living in the light of the power of the gospel? Is the power of, of darkness still keeping you under? All of us wrestle with this, but folks, as we grow in Christ, little by little, we should be learning how to... to um, uh, live more in the power of the gospel than in the power of darkness. 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says, For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Because of this new identity, we have fellowship with Jesus. We don't get to see him face to face, but nonetheless, 
we get to fellowship with him, spirit to spirit. And develop a very real relationship with him. 1 Thessalonians 5.5 5 says, Ye are the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. So while this is true of who we are, this is our new identity, are you living in the light of that identity? Folks, for too many years, we as Christians have been falling away. You know, it's tragic that so many churches are not able to meet today. But folks, think for how many decades church-going Christians who should know better have been placing less and less priority on going to church and being part of the church and, and fellowshipping. Is it any wonder when the church closes, when the government closes us down because they're thinking this is going to be easy to do, they don't really care about it much anyway. And that is true for many, many believers. And they still don't. I was shocked that we, we do a lot of door-to-door -door in the community. And I have been uh, shocked as I meet new people and introducing people to our church. I've been shocked how many Christians say, even when things were opening back up, that they were not going to go back to church. They'd just rather uh, sit at home behind a computer screen if they do that. Folks, if the Lord teaches us anything during this season, may we realize what is most important. And that's the relationship with God. And that's the mission of God. And that's cultivating relationships with one another and redeeming relationships with the lost world around us. That's becoming much more difficult in this season. But I believe if we learn it now, I believe if we say I, we're going to push back against this, we're going to grow our relationships. We're going to pioneer new relationships, even during this pandemic. Folks, I believe God can use this as a school to train deeper disciples than we would otherwise have been. He says, because of our redemption, we are now light, and he uses this phrase, in the Lord. Before you and I become high and mighty and look down our long noses at those who are still uh, lost in sin, God has not made us light necessarily. He says light in the Lord. Even though we have this new nature, we are not intrinsically now perfect and good. Whatever light we have comes from Christ himself. We are not the source of the light. Jesus is. And that's so important to remember. At no point can we ever get on our high horse and look down on the lost and think that now we are somehow uh, some better form of human being. No, we are still sinners, deserving even now of the wrath of God, and yet we've been pardoned and forgiven. And it should not magnify us, it should magnify Jesus. We are now light in the Lord. John 8, 12 says this, Then spake Jesus unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of of life. Folks, there are many, many people searching for light and they don't know where to turn right now. They're searching for answers. You and I have to do all that we can to point people to Jesus. Uh, I recently put out online a, um, a post asking how I can be praying for people. Can I encourage you not just to share that video, but can I encourage you to copy it? To, to do one of your own, to say, hey, how can I be praying for you today and put that on social media? Can I encourage you to go even farther beyond that? Can I en encourage you to reach out and call uh, friends of yours and say, hey, is there any way I can be praying for you today? Even if you made one call a day or you sought to just reach one person a day, folks, it can make a big difference in how bright your light shines over this next week. If we wait to live as Christians until we're back to normal, folks, depending on, <clears throat> I tell you, one of the first things this, uh, that uh, the, I guess, president-elect is saying, one of the first things he's going to do is he's going to lock down the entire country 
when he becomes president. Folks, we cannot wait for things to go back to normal to be the light. We have to start right now, right where we're at. Quickly, let's look at the second point. This comes at the end of verse 8. He says, walk as children of the light. So first, don't participate in the sinful behavior of those that do not know God. But secondly, walk as children of the light. Look at verse 8. He says, walk as children of the light. Verse 9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So now he's defining what this means. He's giving us some more descriptive terms. So he tells us to walk in this new identity. We are now children of the light. I love the word walk because it helps us to realize this is a process. So we become brighter, ideally. The longer we walk with Christ, the more mature that we become, the brighter the light shines. The less we walk in darkness, the less shrouded by darkness we are, and the more we are walking into light, the more we, we learn to run to the light. When I was a young person, I got saved as a child, really started to grow in my walk with the Lord as a teenager. But I can remember being afraid of the light. I can at times even be, uh, remember being afraid of reading the Bible because I was afraid of what it was going to expose that was wrong in my life. And there was a fear of what would be exposed and of the sacrifices that I'd have to go through to, to walk in light. And folks, over time, I began to realize, you know what? That was a, a foolish way of living. Because the longer we live in darkness, folks, destruction abounds in darkness. And by shrouding areas of my life, I was cursing those areas of my life. And we as Christians need to learn that there needs to be this pursuit of truth that says, Lord, at any cost, I want to know the truth because the truth sets free. That's how I find your best for me, Lord, is in the light of truth. And we run to it, realizing that whatever the cost up front is, is um, just uh, very, very small in comparison to our whole life and the, and the rewards. The risk is very small in comparison to the eternal reward, both now and forever. So we as Christians should be those that run to truth, but it's a process to begin to learn to think that way and to begin to learn to live that way. And walk, an ongoing walk is a beautiful pers perspective, beautiful picture, just one step at a time, one decision at a time. It's progressive. That's encouraging to me. And he uses this terminology throughout this chapter. Chapter 4, actually, he starts by saying, uh, walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you've been called. He then says, verse 17, he says, um, walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of your mind. He says again, chapter 5, verse 1, um, he says, you are, uh, verse 2, he says, walk in love. And then in verse 15, he's going to say, that, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. So in each of these ways, learning to walk in love is a process to learn how to become more loving. Learning how to walk worthy of our vocation. Learning how to walk wisely. It's a process. You don't become wise overnight. Why? Because uh, it's un un unlike just reading a book and getting understanding, applying that understanding, takes a lifetime. So walking in this, this identity is a process. And he says, focus here on these three things. He says, the fruit of this new walk, the fruit of the Spirit, is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. So as we begin to walk down this pathway, the Holy Spirit is going to bring about um, certain fruits of walking in the light. The very first is goodness. Goodness is a fruit that the Holy Spirit seeks to produce in a believer's life, first and foremost, because God is good. We find in Galatians chapter 5, in the fruits of the Spirit, it's one of them. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, 
peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there's no law. Aren't you glad that goodness has not been outlawed in this country? We can still be good. So as we're walking with the Lord, as we're being light, he is making us good like he is good. One of the things that is um, magnetic about our God is the scripture says the goodness of God brings people to repentance. And I believe that the goodness that he produces in us is also magnetic. It causes a lost world that's starving for good to see what God is doing in our lives, what God's doing in our homes, and say, you know what, I want some of that for myself. What's the source of that goodness? Reminds me of, I think I mentioned this last week, but it bears repeating, it reminds me of um, de Tocqueville as he was uh, surveying our new nation when we were just founded, and he, he said, I have discovered that America is great because America is good, but if America ever ceases to be good, she will cease to be great. We're beginning to see that in this nation. Folks, we have the source of goodness within us. Let's not strangle that. God wants to manifest that goodness, not just to you, but to those around you. Are you being a vehicle of God's goodness to others. He also says righteousness. The fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness. God is endeavoring to make us righteous. Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 4 says, He is the rock. His work is perfect. For all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity. Just and right is he. We're to be known for our righteousness. For our justice. Doing what's right, no matter what the cost. These are trying days. It remains to be seen what Christianity is going to look like in the next several years, in the next decade. Are we going to be intimidated by the lost world around us, or are we going to seek to do what's right, no matter what the cost? We have the power to do so because God is righteous and he lives within Romans 6.13 says this, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. If it is true, if, if our uh, nation does end up with uh, President Biden and he takes us into a complete and total lockdown like uh, our, our, our country w went through um, earlier this year and we're isolated again, if there's curfews and such, and we're spending a lot of time at home, folks, we've got to ask God for grace. That we treat one another righteously. That we behave ourselves righteously. If the time comes to be civilly disobedient, that we do so, but still do so in a righteous manner. Remember, the wrath of man does not accomplish the righteousness of God. We have to be very, very careful. We can try to do good with the wrong, sometimes in the wrong um, attitude or the wrong way. Scripture is teaching us here that really the believer's growth to maturity necessitates a progressive transformation from unrighteousness to righteousness. You know, many have been spending a lot of time at home. People are falling into destructive patterns. You know, as we're isolated, isolation is the chief component for addiction of any kind. So as we're isolated from one another, if you're not constantly pushing back against that, um, you're going to be more susceptible to temptation. So if, if you have had patterns of depression in the past, this, this could very likely be a very depressing season. If you have had uh, uh, certain addictions in your past, uh, whether it be drugs, alcohol, one thing that is taking our na nation right now is sexual addiction. It's going on behind closed doors. 
and many a Christian is falling during this season. And folks, we have got to be seeking the Lord for victory in this way. We cannot be those who seek to pacify ourselves uh, in anything but God and what is right and what he has sanctioned for us. This does not have to be a time that literally hollows out who we are. We'll say more about that here in a moment. But lastly, uh, the, the third of these is truth. We walk as children of light by growing in goodness, growing in righteousness, and growing in truth. And that's really, I think, the most important of all of these so far. Without the truth, none of the rest of these can happen. Growing in our, in our understanding of the truth and growing in our expression of the truth. And sometimes, folks, this hurts. If you want victory over sexual addiction, which is a major highlight in this passage, because it's so easy to go on no one knows. It's not like you're hungover. It's not like you're, you're uh, uh, on, on some high from drugs or whatever, losing control in that way. You can kind of do this secretly, and, and yet, folks, what the Lord wants for us is to grow in righteousness during this season. That we would not be uh, imbibing to this unrighteous behavior. And it's truth that brings us out. You say, you know what, I, I've got this pattern that's bringing me down. Then, folks, we have to begin by speaking truth to ourselves, and then find someone that we can confide in, someone that we trust, and say, you know what, I'm struggling in this area, and I need some help. I need some accountability. I need some encouragement. Speaking truth, folks, first to yourself and then to one another. We're going to see that here in a moment. Let's move quickly. Not only does he say identify these virtues and, and, and these, these, these fruits will abound in your life, but he tells us to develop discernment. Look at verse 10. He says, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. So as the Lord is giving you truth and you're learning to speak truth to yourself and to those around you, you grow in your discernment. You take another step farther into the light and your God reveals to you then more understanding of the truth and you experience more of it in your life. And you develop more discernment then. Your vision becomes clearer. So as our minds are renewed by God's word, we can discern God's will for our lives. Folks, if you have a little bit more time now being uh, at home or maybe uh, where you used to go is shut down right now, maybe some of your hobbies have been curbed because you can't go and, and do them like you normally would. Folks, let's get in the truth. Let's get in the word. Let's study. Let's memorize scripture and most importantly, let's practice it. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. As we learn God's will, we have to say, Lord, not my will, but yours. And that way we're being a living sacrifice. I, I wanted to do it this way, but you've said do it this way. And so, Lord, I'm choosing to do it in this moment. And in that way, we perform a living sacrifice to God. This is the way he's asked us to live. Every decision is sacrificing ourselves to the better will, the perfect will of God, which brings him the greatest glory and our, also our greatest good. The principal criteria here for us to discern and live in a way, in this way, uh, that is acceptable unto, Lord, unto the Lord um, is found here. Look at 2 Corinthians 5 9. He says, Wherefore we labor that whether present or absent we may be accepted of him. So the idea is we must choose what is acceptable to God. This is the principal criteria. Not what do I want to do in the moment, but Lord, what is acceptable to you? Finding out what is acceptable to God is a process. 
we grow in our understanding of God by reading and knowing his word and understanding it. And since this Bible and this book is uh, a picture of the limitless mind of God, then you, we could never plumb the depths of the word of God in one lifetime. So this is a process. The better you know God, the better you learn what is acceptable to him or not. So in our whole labor, like the Apostle Paul said, is we want to be accepted of God. We want what, he, what we are doing to be acceptable to him. We are accepted through Christ. He's not saying, I'm laboring to try to achieve my salvation. That's not what he's speaking of. He's saying we are laboring that what we are doing would be acceptable to him, is the idea. That's our labor in this Christian life. So, last point, and we're going to wrap it up. Verses 11 to 14. Not only are we to be um, uh, uh, shunning and avoiding the behaviors of the old life, um, and not only are we to be walking now in this new walk, but now we are to be exposing sin. And specifically, exposing sin not on the outside, first and foremost. We start in the house of God. Exposing sin within the body. Look at verse 11, says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, Awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. So there's a couple different schools of thought in this interpretation. Some say we are to be reproving the sin that's out there. But as I've studied a number of different uh, commentators on this passage, um, many believe that because this is written to believers, and he has already given us the warning not to be partaking with those who justify sin, as we saw in verses uh, 6 and 7, that he's speaking of primarily here that we as Christians are to re be rebuking sin in the body with one another. Folks, I think this is one of the reasons that Christianity is losing its power in America because Christians no longer and churches no longer discipline themselves. Church discipline has gone by the wayside. Church membership has gone by the wayside primarily because what do we do when someone's living in willful sin and will not repent? And we say, oh, well, well, we'll let them keep coming to church because, hey, we've thrown out membership anyway. And folks, the scripture says when someone's not living in accordance with the scripture and they're saying, no, this is acceptable in the Christian life and you're going to accept me with this sin and I'm going to practice it blatantly in front of everyone, then folks, that person, the scripture tells us, is to be put outside of the membership of the church. Churches are not practicing this today and we've lost our power. And you see it from the, from the pulpit down to the pew. It's a terrible thing when you find uh, that a church has covered up sin because one of the staff members has, has, has uh, committed some uh, gross immorality. And they say, oh, we don't want the name of Christ to be, to be brought down. So we just won't expose it. Or pastors will say, oh, I, I know that this person has, has, has abused his children sexually. But you know what? We, we won't expose it because... Um, the cause of Christ would be hurt too badly in the community. It would be scandalous. We have to keep it quiet. Folks, that has been done all over this nation for far too long. And unfortunately, it's all denominations. And it's one thing when this happens among the cults. Is it a tragedy when it happens among born-again believing churches? You expect it among the cults. You do not expect it among the church of God. And so we as believers must learn how to develop the boldness and the compassion to say, you know what, the most compassionate thing that we could do is to reprove evil for the growth and restoration of that, of that individual and for the growth and health of our body and for the sake of our mission. 
as being messengers of truth. Folks, we here in the Chicago area have had numerous pastors recently falling into sexual sin or sins of greed, as we've seen here. I tell you what, it is becoming a tough day to be a Christian because of the scandals we are producing and not dealing with properly. Verse 11 says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Folks, we're not to be, to be avoiding relationships with lost people. I don't think that's what this is speaking of. We're to be going into all the world to preach the gospel. The idea is we're not to be having fellowship with their behaviors, with their evil behaviors. These unfruitful works of darkness, they should stand in sharp contrast to the fruits of the Spirit, who is light. <clears throat> Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand, meaning Jesus could be, come back at any moment. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Folks, sometimes it's very, very difficult to do. Sometimes we do that by... When we, on occasion, when we, when we find someone who's been in sin, sometimes, folks, if, as a pastor, when someone comes to me and they've committed a crime, I am responsible to let the police know. And then I'm responsible to let our, our church know so that we can or at least our leadership, so that we can begin to learn how to deal with this. It's how we're going to move forward. It's the best thing for that person, it's the best thing for those victims, and it's ultimately the best thing for the church. The works of darkness include sexual immorality, greed, and this filthy talk, as was talked about in verses 3 through 5. Fornication, all uncleanness, covetousness, let it not once be named among you as become a saint, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know that no whoremonger nor unclean person nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Exposing sin is a critical critical part of the process of, of, of Christian maturity. So as believers grow in Christ, the process of renewal and taking off the old self involves eliminating lifestyles and behaviors that were typical of our pre-Christian lives but are shameful and inappropriate for our new life in Christ. Look at verse 12 there. It says, And have no fellowship uh, with unfruitful dark, uh, works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it's a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. He said, I'm not even going to go into detail about it. And here was a, a, a world in which it was saturated with uh, sexual sin and believers were coming to faith in Christ still in bondage to sexual sin. And many were still practicing this sexual sin behind closed doors. And Paul said, we just can't keep going, moving on as if it doesn't exist. When, it, when you become aware of it, it, you must reprove it. You must say, hey, Christians don't behave this way. I mean, think of it in that day. There were some changes that had to be made. If a master was having a relationship with a slave, he's going to have to do something with that slave. He's going to have to set her free or something or... or, or He's going to have to create a way forward that the temptation's not there anymore. If he used to go down to those, to those public baths that they would have, which was a place of great immorality, which the early church fathers, is interesting, they finally had to make that a church disciplinable offense, that if you went down to the public baths where both men and women would dress down after work 
and they would go into these these baths uh, first a hot one and then a cold one and then uh, and then they would just fellowship completely naked in that public bath and the the, the early church had to finally re, uh, decide you know what uh, if a if a Christian says I'm going to continue to go to this public bath because for one it satisfies my flesh secondly there's some great business relationships there whatever their rationale they were to be rebuked for that and if they continued to do it they were to be put out of the church why because it sullied the testimony of Jesus folks think about that we as Christians have to be so careful nowadays we can do so much behind closed doors us and our computer screen or whatever it may be or us and our movies and no one knows what our family is watching or what we're watching folks we are not to be entertaining ourselves with the filth and with the nudity and with the sexual immorality that this world entertains itself with we are losing our courage we are losing our boldness we are losing our purity because we refuse to live a pure life behind closed doors. Or, maybe you say, oh, I'm just a victim. My, my home is a place of defeat, and so I just go and I just feel like I have to fall. Then, folks, it is your responsibility to change the environment of your home so it's no longer a place of defeat. You say, well, how do I do that? There's a number of ways. If you have problems with a certain device, with a computer, with a phone, you can download. I, I highly recommend everyone here, man and woman, look up the, the website, covenanteyes.com. Covenanteyes.com. Tons of blog posts so you can understand the sexual addiction and how it works on our mind, both for men and women. Also, there's some great tools there. There are, are, are internet filters. There are... Um, also, accountability software that's not a filter because sometimes filters don't work because they're too limiting. It's finally like, man, for work, I have to go here, here, and here. I can't use this device. So sometimes filters are too limiting. So there's something else that's, that's also very powerful that um, it basically records every place that you've been and every, depending on how you set it up, every day or every week, your accountability partners get a record of where you've been. And it's really difficult to watch something you shouldn't watch when you know your best buddies are looking over your shoulder. That those that, uh, the godly people, mentors of yours, are looking over your shoulder every time you go online. Folks, the temptation vanishes. Hallelujah. And in, ways, in such ways, we can begin to change the environment by bringing others into our life so you're literally bringing light into those dark spaces so no longer is it a place of shame. You say, well, my place of defeat is me and my phone uh, in my bedroom, and nobody knows what I'm doing, and, but I, I'm watching things that I shouldn't. Folks, put your phone, charge your phones downstairs. Keep your electronic devices out of your room. Folks, we can begin to do things that set us up for success. The Lord does not want us to be living in shame when we could be living in confidence and peace and rest and rejoicing. He says, wherefore, oh, verse 13, he says, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. We have to find ways, folks, to bring the truth into those dark places of our lives. I think that before we even expose truth in the church, folks, you've got to learn to do it with your, with, we've got to learn to do it with ourselves. It takes great courage and great boldness. And so when we find one another, let's say uh, we're made aware of a Christian brother or sister living in sin, what do we do? 
The Lord tells us in Matthew 18, we don't make a scene. One person goes and confronts that believer, says, hey, what you're doing, are you aware? The scripture says we're not to be doing that, and here's the reasons why. If they don't repent, they say, wait a minute, no, this is, this is acceptable. I don't see it as sin. It's, it, it, I think it's okay. Well, then you bring a second brother. And, and you go and administer that person. You're trying to restore the person. We're not, not, not trying to humiliate. We're not trying to shame. But we are trying to protect. You know, in our, our household, we've got seven children. And we're, we've trained the older ones to be watching out for the younger ones. It would be wrong. We've got a fireplace. It would be wrong if one of our kids was aware that our, one of our youngest was toddling over to try to take a, um, a coal from the fireplace. It would be wrong. It would be a sin against that little one not to say no. And maybe even slap his hand out of the way. He might cry in the moment. Maybe there was something in there he wanted. And sometimes our kids like to put things in the fire they shouldn't put in the fire. And maybe it hurts their feelings. But folks, it is wrong to watch a brother or sister, to knowingly watch a brother or sister destroying themselves and not speak up. It is unloving. It's ungodly. And it's not truthful. Folks, this is a time in which believers are shackled in sin. It's been a discouraging year. And there have been many Christians that have run to the wrong mechanisms to pacify their pain. And folks, we need one another. We need one another to come alongside and to lovingly, as we found in it, what's the, our whole purpose, uh, Ephesians 4 verse 16 the whole body fitly joined together and compacted makes increase. We grow by each contributing. Verse 15 told us in that chapter, speaking the truth in love. So as we're reproving, reproof does not mean the absence of love. No, love is the very motive for truth. It's the very uh, environment of reproof. He says, but all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Wherefore he saith, awake thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. In the moment they might not see it, but the more you speak truth, they begin to realize that's true. You give them the opportunity to awake out of that slumber. And then God gives them more light. You know, when we're bound in sin, it's like we are, we've been made alive spiritually, but we're in a deep slumber. We're in a deep sleep. First Thessalonians 5, verses 5 uh, down through the next several verses here says, ye are, light, ye are the children of light, and the children of the day. We are not of the night, nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night. They that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for an helmet the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us unto wrath, but to obtain, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, may this be a time in which the Lord is trying to get a hold of the attention of his church, both in this country and around the world. Folks, th th this is a day to be watchful. Our freedoms are being stolen right from, our, from under our very noses. Day by day, year by year. But not just that, our freedom in Christ is being stolen as well, folks. And that's really where it starts. We are literally giving away our freedom in Christ as we indulge our evil passions. And we are binding ourselves to the things of this world. We're being bound by the lusts of the flesh. 
Romans 6, 11 to 13 says, Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin. That's a reality, but you have to reckon it to be so. You have to say that is true, even though it doesn't feel to be, to be the case. The Lord has set me free. I have a new master. Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. That's beautiful. The Lord can take us, still sinful and evil as we are, He can now take us since the Holy Spirit lives within us and we've been forgiven and declared righteous. We can now begin to yield ourselves as instruments of righteousness unto God. Whereas before God, uh, the devil used us, to destroy ourselves and others, now God can use us. Not just to sanctify us, but to save others. There's one promise that he says in the end of verse 14. He says, Awake thou that sleepest, arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. Let me remind you of John 8, 12. He said, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So when we have to expose sin, Christ is present with us to sustain us. When we have to expose sin in our life, the Lord is present there to sustain us and give us courage. When we have to point out uh, sin and reprove sin in our local assembly, the Lord is with us in those moments. He is the great sanctifier. And he gives light. His presence goes with us. Folks, there's great urgency here. We'll look at more at this next week. But he says, see then that ye walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise. Redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Wow. We have our work cut out, folks. I tell you, the, the, today could be the day. We have our work cut out. That We must be redeeming the time, making up for, the, for lost ground, so to speak. But we do so as we understand the will of God. Let's be people of the book, not just those who read it, but those who live it, apply it, and proclaim it. So as we close, a few questions. Folks, first, do you have a new identity in Christ? None of this applies to you if you have not yet placed your faith in Jesus. If you'd like information, please send me a direct message right there through uh, social media. Or, or you can give, give us a call or send me an email at pastor at shorewoodbaptist.com. I can get you some information that will help you to make that decision. Secondly, are you living in the light of your new identity in Christ? Can people see the fruits of the Spirit in your life? Can you see it? Can others see it? That goodness, that righteousness, that truth. Are you developing the ability to discern God's will, which you only do through application, not through just mere study? Are you living to please God or those around you? And does your, life, does your lifestyle expose sin by contrast? Folks, I think that's one reason why Christians are still hated in this country is because, by and large, we still do provide a contrast. But not all Christians provide the contrast. Does your life contrast with the darkness around you? And are you willing to shine brightly for Christ, even when it means exposing the sin of another believer? Well, that brings us to the end. We're going to close in prayer in just a minute. Let me encourage you. We can't take an offering here physically, but... Uh, I I'd encourage you to send an offering uh, through our text to give number. Uh, you can go to our website, shorebaptist.com backslash give. And I don't have our text to give number right here. I think it's 815-581-8001.
and text GIVE to that number. But uh, either that or go to shorewoodbaptist.com slash GIVE. You can also send in your offerings to our P.O. Box. It's um, Shorewood Baptist Church, 1147 Brook Forest Avenue. PMB as in post mailbox 53, Shorewood, Illinois, 60404. Uh, 60404. And um, your tithes and offerings are de definitely needed during this time. We still are renting this facility, even though it's just me and our uh, few volunteers here. So thank you so much for your prayers, for your support. Let's pray and ask for God's blessing. Father,